Slime. Written by Joseph Payne Brennan. Told to you by Edward E. French. It was a great gray-black hood of horror moving over the floor of the sea. It slid through the soft ooze like a monstrous mantle of slime obscenely animated with questing life. It was by turns viscous and fluid. At times it flattened out and flowed through the carpet of mud like an inky pool. Occasionally it paused, seeming to shrink in upon itself and reared up out of the ooze until it resembled an irregular cone or a gigantic hood. Although it possessed no eyes, it had a marvelously developed sense of touch, and it possessed a sensitivity to minute vibrations which was almost akin to telepathy. It was plastic, essentially shapeless. It could shoot out long tentacles until it bore a resemblance to a nightmare squid or a huge starfish. It could retract itself into a round, flattened disk or squeeze into an irregular hunched shape so that it looked like a black boulder sunk on the bottom of the sea. It had prowled through the black water endlessly. It had been formed when the earth and the seas were young. It was almost as old as the ocean itself. It moved through a night which had no beginning and no disillusion. The black sea basin where it lurked had been dark since the world began, an environment only a little less inimical than the stupendous gulfs of interplanetary space. It was animated by a single, unceasing, never-satisfied drive, a voracious, insatiable hunger it could survive for months without food. But minutes after eating, it was as ravenous as ever. Its appetite was appalling and incalculable. On the icy ink-black floor of the sea, the battle for survival was savage, hideous and usually brief. But for the shape of moving slime, there was no battle. It ate whatever came its way, regardless of size, shape or disposition. It absorbed microscopic plankton and giant squid with equal assurance. Had its surface been less fluid, it might have retained the circular scars left by the grappling suckers of the wildly threshing deep-water squid, or the jagged tooth marks of the anachronistic frill shark. But as it was, neither left any evidence of its absorption. When the lifting curtain of living slime swayed out of the mud and closed upon them, their fiercest death throes came to nothing. The horror did not know fear. There was nothing to be afraid of. It ate whatever moved or tried not to move, and it had never encountered anything which could in turn eat it. If a squid's sucker or a shark's tooth tore into the mass of its viscosity, the rent flowed in upon itself and immediately closed. If a segment was detached, it could be retrieved and absorbed back into the hole. The black mantle reigned supreme in its savage world of slime and silence. It groped greedily and endlessly through the mud, eating and never sleeping, never resting. If it lay still, it was only to trap food which otherwise might be lost. If it rushed with terrifying speed across the slimy bottom, it was never to escape an enemy, but always to flop its hideous fluidity upon its sole and inevitable quarry. Food. It had evolved out of the muck and slime of the primitive sea floor, and it was as alien to ordinary terrestrial life as the weird denizens of some wild planet in a distant galaxy. It was an anachronistic experiment of nature, compared to which the saber-toothed tiger, the woolly mammoth, and even Tyrannosaurus, the slashing, murderous king of the great earth reptiles, were as tame, weak entities. Had it not been for a vast volcanic upheaval on the bottom of the ocean basin, the black horror would have crept out its entire existence on the silent sea ooze without ever manifesting its hideous powers to mankind. Fate, in the form of a violent subterranean explosion covering huge areas of the ocean's floor, 
hurled it out of its black slime world and sent it spinning toward the surface. Had it been an ordinary deep water fish, it never would have survived the experience. The explosion itself, or the drastic lessening of water pressure as it shot toward the surface would have destroyed it. But it was no ordinary fish. Its viscosity, or plasticity, or whatever it was that constituted its essentially amoebic structure, permitted it to survive. It reached the surface slightly stunned and flopped on the surging waters like a great blob of black rubber. Immense waves, stirred up by the subterranean explosion, swept it swiftly toward shore, and because it was somewhat stunned, it did not try to resist the roaring mountains of water. Along with scattered ash, pumice, and the puffed bodies of dead fish, the black horror was hurled toward a beach. The huge waves carried it more than a mile inland, far beyond the strip of sandy shore, and deposited it in the midst of a deep, brackish swamp area. As luck would have it, the submarine explosion and subsequent tidal wave took place at night, and therefore the slime horror was not immediately subjected to a new and hateful experience. Light. Although the midnight darkness of the storm-lashed swamp did not begin to compare to the Stygian blackness of the sea bottom, or even violet rays of the spectrum could not penetrate, the marsh darkness was nevertheless deep and intense. As the water of the great wave receded, sluicing back through the thorn jungle and back out to sea, the black horror clung to a mud bank surrounded by a rank growth of cattails. It was aware of the sudden, startling change in its environment, and for some time it lay motionless, concentrating its attention on obscure internal readjustment which the absence of crushing pressure and a surrounding cloak of frigid seawater demanded. Its adaptability was incredible and horrifying. It achieved in a few hours what an ordinary creature could have attained only through a process of gradual evolution. Three hours after the titanic wave flopped it onto the mud bank, it had undergone swift, organic changes which left it relatively at ease in its new environment. In fact, it felt lighter and more mobile than it ever had before in its sea basin existence. As it flung out feelers and attuned itself to the minutest vibrations and emanations of the swamp area, its pristine hunger drive reasserted itself with overwhelming urgency, and the tail which its sensory apparatus returned to the monstrous something which served as a brain excited it tremendously. It sensed at once that the swamp was filled with luscious tidbits of quivering food. More food, and food of a greater variety than it had ever encountered on the cold floor of the sea. Its savage, incessant hunger seemed unbearable. Its slimy mass was swept by a shuddering wave of anticipation. Sliding off the mud bank, it slithered over the cattails into an adjacent area consisting of deep, black pools interspersed with waterlogged tussocks. Weed stalks stuck up out of the water, and the decayed trunks of fallen trees floated half-submerged in the larger pools. Ravenous with hunger, it sloshed into the bog area, flicking its fluid tentacles about. Within minutes, it had snatched up several fat frogs and a number of small fish, these, however, merely titillated its appetite. Its hunger turned into a kind of ecstatic fury. It commenced a systematic hunt, plunging to the bottom of each pool and quickly but carefully exploring every inch of its oozy bottom. The first creature of any size which it encountered was a muskrat. An immense curtain of adhesive slime suddenly swept out of the darkness, closed upon it, and squeezed. Heartened and wetted by its find, the Hood of Horror rummaged the rank pools with renewed zeal. When it surfaced, it carefully probed the tussocks for anything that might have escaped in the water. Once it snatched up a small bird nesting in some swamp grass. Occasionally it slithered up the crisscrossed trunks of fallen trees, bearing them down with its unspeakable slimy bulk, and hung briefly suspended like a great dripping curtain of black marsh mud. 
It was approaching a somewhat less swampy and more deeply wooded area when it gradually became aware of a subtle change in its new environment. It paused, hesitating, and remained half in and half out of a small pond near the edge of the nearest trees. Although it had absorbed 25 or 30 pounds of food in the form of frogs, fish, water snakes, the muskrat and a few smaller creatures, its fierce hunger had not left it. Its monstrous appetite urged it on. And yet something held it anchored in the pond. What it sensed, but could not literally see, was the rising sun spreading a gray light over the swamp. The horror had never encountered any illumination except that generated by the grotesque phosphorescent appendages of various deep sea fishes. Natural light was totally unknown to it. As the dawn light strengthened, breaking through the scattering storm clouds, the black slime monster, fresh from the inky floor of the sea, sensed that something utterly unknown was flooding in upon it. Light was hateful to it. It cast out quick feelers, hoping to catch and crush the light. But the more frenzied its efforts became, the more intense became the abhorred aura surrounding it. At length, as the sun rose visibly above the trees, the horror, in baffled rage rather than in fear, grudgingly slid back into the pond and burrowed into the soft ooze of its bottom. There it remained while the sun shone and the small creatures of the swamp ventured forth on furtive errands. A few miles away from Wharton's swamp, in the small town of Clinton Center, Henry Hossing sleepily crawled out of the improvised alley shack which had afforded him a degree of shelter for the night and stumbled into the street. Passing a hand across his roomy eyes, he scratched the stubble on his cheek and blinked listlessly at the rising sun. He had not slept well. The storm of the night before had kept him awake. Besides, he had gone to bed hungry. And that never agreed with him. Glancing furtively along the street, he walked slouched forward with his head bent down, and most of the time he kept his eyes on the walk or on the gutter in the hopes of spotting a chance coin. Clinton Center had not been kind to him. The handouts were sparse, and only yesterday he had been warned out of town by one of the local policemen. Grumbling to himself, he reached the end of the street and started to cross. Suddenly, he stopped quickly and snatched up something from the edge of the pavement. It was a crumpled green bill, and as he frantically unfolded it, a look of stupefied rapture spread across his bristly face. Ten dollars! More money than he had possessed at any one time in months! Stowing it carefully in the one good pocket of his seedy gray jacket, he crossed the street with a swift stride. Instead of sweeping the sidewalks, his eye now darted along the rows of stores and restaurants. He paused at one restaurant, hesitated, and finally went on until he found another less pretentious one a few blocks away. When he sat down, the counterman shook his head. Get going, bud. No free coffee today. With a wide grin, the hobo produced his ten-dollar bill and spread it on the counter. That covers a good breakfast here, partner. The counterman seemed irritated. Okay, okay, what'll you have? He eyed the bill suspiciously. Henry Hossing ordered orange juice, toast, ham and eggs, oatmeal, melon, and coffee. When it appeared, he ate every bit of it, ordered additional cups of coffee, paid the check as if two-dollar breakfasts were customary with him, and then sauntered back to the street. Shortly after noon, after his three-dollar lunch, he saw the liquor store. For a few minutes he stood across the street from it, fingering his five-dollar bill. Finally he crossed with an abstracted smile, entered, and bought a quart of rye. He hesitated on the sidewalk, debating whether or not he should return to the little shack in the side alley. After a minute or two of indecision, he decided against it and struck out instead for Wharton's swamp. The local police were far less likely to disturb him there, and since the skies were clearing and the weather mild, there was little immediate need of shelter. Angling off the highway which skirted the swamp several miles from town, he crossed a marshy meadow, pushed through a fringe of brush, and sat down under a sweet gum tree which bordered a deeply wooded area. By late afternoon he had achieved a quite cheerful glow, and he had little inclination to return to Clinton Center. 
Rousing himself from reverie, he stumbled about collecting enough wood for a small fire and went back to his sylvan seat under the sweet gum. He slept briefly as dusk descended, but finally bestirred himself again to build a fire as deeper shadows fell over the swamp. Then he returned to his swiftly diminishing bottle. He was suspended in a warm net of inflamed fantasy when something abruptly broke the spell and brought him back to earth. The flickering flames of his fire had dwindled down until now only a dim, eerie glow illuminated the immediate area under the sweet gum. He saw nothing, and at the moment heard nothing. And yet he was filled with a sudden and profound sense of lurking menace. He stood up, staggering, leaned back against the sweet gum, and peered fearfully into the shadows. In the deep darkness beyond the waning arc of firelight he could distinguish nothing which had any discernible form or color. Then he detected the stench and shuddered. In spite of the reek of cheap whiskey which clung around him, the smell was overpowering. It was heavy, fulsome, fetid, alien and utterly repellent. It was vaguely fish-like, but otherwise beyond any known comparison. As he stood trembling under the sweet gum, Henry Hossing thought of something dead which had lain for long ages at the bottom of the sea. Filled with mounting alarm, he looked around for some wood which he might add to the dying fire. All he could find nearby, however, were a few twigs. He threw these on, and the flames licked up briefly and subsided. He listened and heard, or imagined he heard, an odd sort of slithering sound in the nearby bushes. It seemed to retreat slightly as the flames shot up. Genuine terror took possession of him. He knew that he was in no condition to flee, and now he came to the horrifying conclusion that whatever unspeakable menace waited in the surrounding darkness was temporarily held at bay by the failing gleam of his little fire. Frantically, he looked around for more wood, but there was none. None, that is, within the faint glow of firelight, and he dared not venture beyond. He began to tremble uncontrollably. He tried to scream, but no sound came out of tightened throat. The ghastly stench became stronger, and now he was sure that he could hear a strange sliding, slithering sound in the black shadows beyond the remaining spark of firelight. He stood frozen in absolute helpless panic as the tiny fire smoldered down into darkness. At that last instant a charred bit of wood broke apart, sending up a few sparks, and in that flicker of final light he glimpsed the horror. It had already glided out of the bushes, and now it rushed across the small clearing with nightmare speed. It was a final incarnation of all the fears, shuddering apprehensions, and bad dreams which Henry Hossing had ever known in his life. It was a fiend from the pit of hell come to claim him at last. A terrible, ringing scream burst from his throat, but it was smothered before it was finished as the black shape of slime fastened upon him with irresistible force. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.